The first uh, piece of Lovemar glass that I had ever seen was this wine glass. And that series, I think, is the most delicate and beautiful um, series of drinking glasses that I've ever seen. That was my first exposure to Lovemar and the quality of Lovemar and the fact that these were still being made. I was just amazed. When I did my project with them about six years ago, we would go out to the factory um, in the countryside and spend days working with the glass maker. That sort of detailed look at insect and bird life that was popular then, mm -hmm. and obviously uh, you've integrated into your work. Did, how about the placement of the butterflies? I wanted actually the artists and the engravers to um, do it randomly, so each mm -hmm. one would be unique. Right. So basically I gave them ideas of where you, they might do it. Right. It, was hard, it was hard actually to get, some, to get some of them not to put them symmetrically, right? right. Where, right. Where, where like the Habsburg insignia would be. Right. They gave me an office that was filled with uh, the archives and there were drawings stacked to the ceiling along with flat files and I was just amazed at what they had. These gorgeous 19th century renderings of, uh, of the painting, the uh, engraving the shapes. Found the um, archival cutout uh, for the um, for that vase on the left, and and it is quite an amazing object. Mm -hmm. The schnitte behind it, which is the cutout, um, is what's brought to the mold maker and into the blowing room in order to capture the uh, the uh, shape of the the finished glass. And um, I think what's wonderful about Hertel, and we have drawings behind us here. Um, also from the Cooper Hewitt archive, um, that his drawings um, are very much like the realized glass. The lightness, the delicacy, it's as thin as glass can possibly be. The, the enameled pieces um, uh, again, are extremely labor intensive. They're um, uh, this, this turquoise and white and, and gilt. So there's a, a perfectionism going on that didn't exist before. And it starts with a drawing, and then they do a, um, a silhouette, which we have the first blow of glass. We have a mold here, which is um, has been used. Um, the wooden molds are turned on site, and um, as they um, carbonize or become a bit like charcoal, they, they work even better. They have to blow a few glasses um, in order to get that mold to really work correctly. Um, so they blow into the mold to get these shapes, and um, the, first, the first blow is that bubble, then they blow it into this form, and then they add up the stem, and then they add the foot, and then they have to cut off the top, and then they start cutting the prismatic um, with, with a very coarse wheel. Um, so they're going from the hot room where they're blowing into the cold room, and, and each step is a you know, rough grinding wheel, a finer grinding wheel, a finer grinding wheel, and then a polish, and then they paint on, this insignia is um, the uh, coat of arms of, uh, of the Imperial coat of arms of Austria. And then they, with these little copper wheel tools, um, it's kind of a lost art that they're still able to do, they would engrave these, um, these uh, monograms or insignias on the glass. I love the, the way each glass reflects whatever, what liquid would go into it, which we don't do anymore. Now we tend to like take like a juice glass and put our vodka or our wine or whatever into it. And these pieces, when I looked at them, I thought these must, must have been done in the 1950s, but in fact they were done in 1856. Um, 
um, they might have been engraved, which might have given them a more 19th century tone, but the shapes are extremely pure, look very contemporary. And um, in a certain way, these shapes made later shapes possible. It's, it's absolutely virtuosic.